Hello and welcome to United States History 11. This is the first lecture. I'm going to be starting off with United States History before United States History actually begins. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the people who were here before the arrival of the Europeans. And that, of course, means Native Americans. But let me just apologize first for this particular format. It is nowhere near as expressive, exciting, uh, as an actual classroom lecture where I have access to more means of audiovisual presentation. This is a bit dry, but it is, given the circumstances that we are currently under, the best that I can do. I'm sure that other instructors are quite capable of inserting multimedia and a variety of other things into their videos, but my skills are not up to that particular task yet. So this is the best that I'm going to be able to do for now, at least. Maybe in the future things will improve a bit, but hopefully we'll be getting back to classroom lectures and that'll take care of the problem entirely and I won't have to worry about doing all of this. So I'm going to be doing a lecture on Native Americans and uh, to understand that we have to recall how it is that humans have gotten into the Americas and the current theory that most scholars place their faith in is one where humans having evolved in Africa will begin to move out of Africa in waves and moving into various other areas at different times. And about 17,000 years ago, they will begin to cross into North America. And we believe this is done via a land bridge that will have been created due to the last ice age, where so much of the water is uh, taken up in the polar ice caps, north and south, as well as in various different glacial uh, regions that will have existed in other parts of the world as well. This lowers the water in the oceans, and it will allow for this small area here to become much larger and to become dry enough that animals will be able to cross over, and it's the animals that the humans will follow into the New World, into the Americas. One problem with this particular theory, however, is that it is one in which we don't have any archaeological evidence to support this. This is a very logical explanation of why humans will have crossed over from Asia into the Americas. But we have not yet actually found any of this evidence. And the particular reason for this is that, again, as the ice has melted, the seas have risen once again, and most of the areas that the humans will have stopped in along their way into North America will now be covered over by water. Competing theory is that rather than traveling by land across this area into North America, is that they will have traveled in uh, boats and thus along the route of land that is, of course, obviously now covered up by water. Some of the earliest of Native American sites that we found, interestingly, show that humans are in South America not too long after the earliest areas that we we'll see in North America. And that can be for a variety of different reasons. The 
most prevalent theory today is that, again, people traveling along the coast, probably by boat, will be able to quickly manage to traverse this distance down into South America. Other competing theories that are less um, well-known and or also theories that are not as accepted are that when you get to individuals like Thor Heyerdahl, for example, who will claim that the people in South America, perhaps even in Central America, will have been seeded there by Polynesians. Polynesians are individuals who have made their way across the Pacific, highland hopping, using a variety of techniques spanning vast distances across the ocean, going from one island location to another until eventually they will make it into the Americas. But again, as I said, this is not commonly accepted. We still don't have as much evidence as we do with the uh, boat theory here, moving from North to South America though there are certain artistic similarities that exist between Polynesian culture and that of certain Central and South American Native American tribes. But simply because diverse people who have no contact with one another have certain stylistic similarities, it doesn't necessarily mean that they actually had contact. We have many different examples of this actually taking place. But it is a bit supportive of the idea that maybe Polynesians were able to make it into Central and South America. But again, we don't really know. For sure. All right, since we've talked about their arrival into the Americas, we need to focus primarily on the Native Americans in the United States area. Now, there are literally hundreds of Native American tribal organizations that exist in this region alone. And this course is not long enough to go through all of them. So instead, I'm going to present to you a variety of them, showing you that there are differences. Uh, they are uh, very unique, very interesting, and I would strongly encourage students to at higher institutions where these types of courses are available to take a course in Native American history. So. The first that we're going to focus on, and by the way, we're only going to talk about a few of them. Uh, the first that uh, we'll talk about is in the southwest of the United States in what is currently today uh, the Arizona and New Mexico region. And these are the Anasazi. Now, that isn't the name that they call themselves. We don't know what it is that they call themselves, principally because they don't have a written language, and they therefore don't leave a record for us to be able to know. Instead, the name Anastasi comes from when Europeans will enter into this area and find these magnificent ruins and ask the Native Americans where or who had created these ruins, these vast cities. And the Native Americans in the area will say that they were built by the Anasazi, translating out in their language to English. It essentially means the old ones, the old people. So, all that we know about these Native Americans in this early period is what comes to us from archaeology. That's principally because, as I said, they don't 
have a written language, they haven't left behind any diaries or government documents telling us what it was that they did, what they accomplished, what they thought, how they felt, all of this type of thing. So from archaeology, we know that they will move into the area uh, several thousand years ago. Uh, it varies as to exactly when, but we do know that when they first arrive into this area, archaeologists refer to this as their first stage of development, and here they will be living not in these grand cities. They won't build these immediately. Instead, they will be living in natural formations of caves, such as this. And as you can see, these are above ground. These particular ones may well have actually have been not naturally formed caves. And here's another example of a human-made cave, the sides of this uh, ridge or this uh, mountain here. But certainly at first they will be living in natural formations of caves. This is due to the fact that caves are a actually a pretty good place to live. They afford, especially in an environment such as the southwest of the United States, where the temperatures can get very, very hot. We know this in the Central Valley because they can get pretty hot here too. And insulation is a key to human survival, human comfort, human ability to continue to exist in this environment. And caves have a overabundance of insulation. Living in a cave, the interior temperature really doesn't vary a whole lot due to that insulation. Usually, if the temperature is 120 degrees outside, the interior of the cave is going to be somewhere in the 70s. So it's nice. It's comfortable. Why wouldn't you want to live in a cave? In fact, uh, here in Fresno, we have an example of a modern-day cave, the Forestier Underground Gardens. Now, usually it's at this point that I will begin to show a video on the forest here, underground gardens for those of you, and there should be almost nobody who doesn't know about the forest here, underground gardens here in this area. They are a not just a local treasure, but a national treasure, and indeed a world treasure, as people from all around the world will come and visit this location. It's in Fresno. You can look it up. You can find a video on it. And I strongly suggest that you do in order to get an idea of what it is that I'm talking about. And tours are available. I remember when I was going to elementary school that they offered these tours. And we went uh, an entire class, most of the school, out to the Forest Year Underground Gardens and toured these locations. And they are wonderful. Uh, created essentially by one individual. Uh, it was supposed to be eventually a hotel for people to uh, come and stay at some place that would afford a cool and really unusual environment for people to live in. Uh, but uh, again, he died before he could complete it. But it is amazing just how much was completed by him and just how fantastic this uh, particular place is, so strongly urge you to do a little bit of research on your own to take a look at it. So, caves are nice places to live in. We would probably do well today of building our homes underground instead of above ground with the type of housing that we have now that has so little insulation that we rely very heavily upon electricity, power, and technology, air conditioners, in order to allow us to 
be comfortable living in this particular area. Uh, anyway, eventually there aren't enough of these naturally formed caves, and so they will begin to create these man-made types of caves and that will allow for more and more people to live in the same location. Now, the problem with caves is, especially with caves that are naturally formed, that they are not always where you want them to be, close to fresh water sources, close to where uh, game is plentiful, animals that you can hunt, or where there is vegetation that you can gather. Roots, berries, nuts, things of this nature. So eventually they will begin to create other types of man-made caves. They will create adobe huts. Adobe huts, very thick-walled, granting a very large amount of insulation. It isn't as comfortable, as cool as a cave is, but these adobe huts are going to allow you the ability to build where you want to live, where there is plentiful water, where there is enough game and vegetation for you to survive. From their burial sites, we know that they uh, burying various items along with the individual, that they had woven baskets where they will use these baskets in order to gather a variety of different types of plant foods, roots, berries, nuts, these types of things and that they didn't have a lot of clothing that they wore. Now, that's, that's not to say that uh, they were you know, primitive or something of that nature. It just simply means that the environment in which they lived meant that they really didn't need a lot of clothing. Indeed, uh, you can actually do pretty good walking around naked, it's, <laughs> I wouldn't advise it because you can get arrested for that, except in certain locations, but it is generally cooler than wandering around with a lot of clothes on. Although I have heard and seen that there are certain techniques that you can use in dressing that will allow you to wear a good many clothes and yet stay cooler than walking around with very little clothing on. You do this, again, by insulation. Uh, you can look that up. I'll let you. Usually I show a video <laughs> on that as well. But hey, you're not going to be able to do that. But anyway, it's the type of clothing that the desert dwellers in the Middle East will have worn. In either case, uh, they will have sandals as well. Ground can get extremely hot and there are small rocks that can cut your feet, that type of thing. So sandals made from plant fibers woven together will do nicely. We then come to their second stage of development and here we begin to see a differentiation between the first one in that they are now beginning to use pottery instead of baskets. Although, in addition to baskets, I mean. And that will allow them not only to use these pots to gather, but also to cook in. They will not have, as there are no Native American tribes in either North, Central, or South America that have the potter's wheel. Now, if you've had a pottery class, you know what the potter's wheel is. And here I would also show you a video on uh, various different types of potter's wheels that have been used by ancient civilizations. But again, I don't have 
uh, the ability to do that with this type of software, at least that I know of. <laughs> uh, but in either case, you can, again, look that up on your own. Potter's wheels are uh, a device that can allow you to create pottery very quickly and create pots that are much more symmetrical. They are generally more thin-walled than without a potter's wheel. Generally, that means that individuals are going to be using a snake or coil method of creating a pot. You basically create from clay these long snake-like or coil-like strands of pottery or clay and you place them one on top of the other in the shape that you want to create and eventually you've created your pot. Of course you'll have to smooth it out a bit but it can work. It's often a bit more time consuming to do but it can be done. The third stage of the development of the Anastasi is one in which there is a massive outpouring of development, a blossoming of their civilization, one in which they have a huge number of new techniques, new technologies, new all kinds of things that they will have developed. It's here during their third stage that they will create these magnificent cliffside cities. Uh, let me show you a couple of other images. Here's another one. You can get an idea of the scale of these cliff cities. By looking here, you can see tourists who are taking a guided tour around here. So these are fairly large buildings, several stories in height. Here's another one showing you some of the building material that could have been used, and a variety of building material is used to create these, from uh, bricks, adobe bricks, to uh, stone, to a variety of different types of material. Now, the reason that this period of the Anastasi is so dramatically changed is because of the introduction of agriculture. It's unlikely that they will have developed agriculture independently, since they will be using corn as part of their agriculture. And corn, as we know, comes from the central region of uh, Mexico, and it will then spread out north and south and uh, will be used in many different locations by many different Native Americans. So, the thing that they will invent that will enable them to have agriculture is irrigation. In this area of the world there are no year-round freshwater sources like rivers like the Nile, like the Tigris and the Euphrates, like the Yellow River, these types of places where civilizations developed along the rivers tapping those waters to create irrigation, to create agriculture. That doesn't exist in this area. Other ancient civilizations that have developed without such river systems have relied very heavily upon natural rainfall. This area of the world, however, does not have very much natural rainfall. Though a few thousand years ago, the amount of rain that fell in this area is greater than it is today. It is still insufficient to be able to water the numbers of crops uh, that you would need to grow with agriculture. 
So, how then did they develop agriculture in this area? What they did was they decided to, or they came up with the idea, that what you could do is save all of that rainwater that was falling down and running away down the sides of the mountains and into rivers, creating flash floods of massive amounts of water just sweeping away off into nowhere. But instead, if you created channels, grooves, little irrigation ditches on the sides of the mountains for miles around, you could channel all of that rainwater into one central location. And then, when you needed it, it would be available for you. You would be able to dip in your bucket, pull out water, and irrigate your crops. And with that, they are able to grow enough food to feed a far larger population. And with greater civilization, they can be able to have people do more than just hunting or gathering. They can begin to now full-time make pots or baskets. In fact, with uh, baskets during this era, they will develop types of baskets that are watertight, now carry water in them as well. In fact, they have baskets that can not only have water in them, but you can actually boil water in these plant fiber baskets as well. Now you don't, obviously, you don't put it over an open flame and uh, cause the water to boil that way. Instead, what you would do is you'd take a very hot rock, you'd place it inside of the basket where you have your water or other substance that you want to warm up, and you move the rock around, making sure that it doesn't make contact for very long with the plant material of the basket itself. And in this way, you can boil water. So at any rate, uh, individuals can begin to specialize in making baskets and pottery and clothing. And yes, people are beginning to use clothing now, uh, shoes, variety of different types of shoes as well, jewelry, children's toys, a huge, huge flowering explosion of things are beginning to be developed here. But around the 1300s, we begin to see something that is unexpected. And that is, and unexpected for them as well. And that is that their population will begin to be severely reduced. Now, there are a number of competing theories as to why that is. One is that there is a uh, severe prolonged drought, what we refer to as El Nino today, where in California we know that occasionally for uh, varying lengths of time that the amount of rainfall that occurs can be greatly reduced. And it's certainly a possibility that the Anasazi will be faced with a very prolonged drought. We know that sometimes droughts can last for over a hundred years. That would not be a good thing to happen today. But certainly, it is possible. And with this reduction in rainfall, they have less food. And we know that their population is being reduced because of a growing number of graves that uh, year after year are more than they were before, showing people are dying off more rapidly. We also see in some of their remains that there are signs that people were being butchered. Bones that have certain markings on them indicating that 
an implement, a tool was used to scrape off the flesh from the bones. That's usually indicative of that flesh being used for food. Now, it could be that they're eating the human flesh because their food supply is so short that it's either eat grandma or die. Or it could be that there was an introduction of a new religious philosophy in that, and we have indicators of this type of thing from other civilizations around the world, where there are some civilizations that believe that if you eat someone, you ingest them into you, they become a part of you, they stay with you. Sometimes this is used to imbue an individual with the power of one's enemies. You kill them, you eat them, you gain their power. Sometimes this is used in order to honor that particular individual. You love them, you cared for them, you don't want them to depart from you. So you bring them into you, you incorporate them into yourself. They become a part of you, they stay with you for the rest of your life. So it's certainly possible that that might be happening. But most scholars believe that it is due to a lack of food source, probably because of the lack of rain falling that this is happening. Others show that it is a about this particular time that other Native Americans begin to enter the, into the area as well. And some believe that there is competition going on between these new Native Americans and the old Native Americans who used to be living there by themselves. And they, there's only so many resources, only so much land, only so much for so many people that eventually warfare will happen, and that uh, people will begin to die from this warfare. That's certainly a possibility also. Native Americans will fight amongst each other for resources, for, well, for a variety of different reasons, just like everyone else in other parts of the world. Now, these new Native Americans, uh, among them are the Navajo and the Apache, will also be so impressed by the Anasazi, and who wouldn't be? I mean, look at this. This is very impressive. That they will begin to incorporate certain aspects of the Anasazi civilization into their own civilization. So they'll take on some of the characteristics of the language, some of the characteristics of the religion, clothing styles, various different types of things that they will incorporate from the Anastasi into their own civilization. We see the remnants of that still today in the Navajo and Apache cultures. But around the 1500s, early 1500s, the Anastasi have all abandoned their great cliffside dwelling places that they lived in. And the reason that they'll live in them is, well, it's controversial. There are a number of reasons for why they will begin to live in here. Well, first of all, it's it's magnificent. You get a fantastic view living here. It's not at the base of the mountain. It's not at the top of the mountain. It's in the mountain itself. It's kind of a big man-made cave. So you can look out over surrounding area. It also affords a good deal of protection. As you can see from here, what you can't see is that at the base of the mountain, getting up to this location, 
is difficult to do. And there are no permanent pathways up to here. There are no trails, no stairs that lead up here. There are some, but those are broken, probably purposefully, and that you can only then get to the next level up from a ladder. And so we believe that these were also created for protection. Now, protection from what exactly? Well, again, we don't know for sure. There are a number of possibilities. One is that it's protection from natural predators in the environment, coyotes, rattlesnakes, other types of things like tarantulas, lots of tarantulas in this area. If you've ever been in the foothills around where we live here in the Central Valley, you know that there are lots of tarantulas in the foothills, and during tarantula season, they will migrate. They'll move from one area to another, and they do so in massive waves of these spiders. And nobody wants to live under those conditions. Even those individuals who relish eating tarantulas, and there are a number of civilizations where eating tarantula is a delicacy. And it's also at this point that I would show students videos on people in a variety of different cultures eating tarantulas in various different ways that people cook and eat them. They are a source of protein. So either from natural predators or because of the conflict that may have existed between the Navajo and the Apache, Apache and the Anasazi. So this would have been protection from human predators. Certainly it's a possibility. Another is that if you build your city at the base of the mountain, uh, very often pieces of the mountain break off and roll down, and you don't want that rolling through your city. So you build it where it's unlikely to have that happen, either in the middle or at the top of the mountain itself. Now, we have done fairly re recently uh, DNA compilations of uh, the Anasazi and other Native Americans in the area, and we've shown that the Zuni and the Hopi are actually genetic descendants of the Anasazi. So they didn't completely die out, either from starvation or from warfare or any other types of activities. They will continue to live on. It's just that their civilization will collapse due to a variety of different reasons. All right, from there we move then to the next Native American group that we'll be talking about, and that is the Cahokia culture, sometimes also known as the Mississippian culture, and sometimes also known as the Mound Builders. These are Native Americans who live in the Ohio and Upper Mississippi River Valley areas. From archaeological evidence, we know that they arrived in the area about 1000 BC. Interestingly, when these Native Americans were first found, and they were first found by Americans who will move into this area in the early 1800s, settling down with their farms, they will begin to find a variety of uh, mounds of dirt in their farmland, and some of them will look like this, although this is an area that's been mowed, so you can clearly see the shape of these mounds, though you can still see some of the trees here that haven't been removed. So weeds would have been in the area, trees even, and you wouldn't have known what the shape was. All you would have known was that, hey, there's this big area of dirt here. Uh, don't want that 
makes it difficult for me to plow my fields, plant my crops, make money, survive. So some of the farmers in the area will begin to remove them, and some of them will find, uh, upon removing them, that there are human remains in them. Now, of course, they'll assume that perhaps uh, there had been a murder and someone had buried somebody on their property, and so they'll contact local law enforcement. Some of them will say, no, these are uh, long dead. Uh, you'll probably want to contact some uh, smart person at uh, the university or college, and they'll be able to figure out what's going on here. And eventually archaeologists will come out into the area, and they'll begin to do excavations of these mounds. Some of them are small in size. Some of them are very large. This is one of the larger ones here. This one was, we believe, actually used as not just a place for the burial of individuals, not just one individual, but oftentimes many, although you can find one single individual in these mounds as well. But generally, you'll find a number of individuals. But this was also used as a platform for them to build their homes on as well. So you'd have a burial site and living space all in the same area. Who wouldn't want to live with Grandma? I mean, come on. She's gone, but not forgotten. She's still here protecting you. Why not? A number of different civilizations actually do this. Now, one of the reasons why they would have built this mound, not just for burial, was that you have rivers in this area that will flood over, and there's a lot of flat land here, so a very wide area will be flooded over. But if you have built up, you live up here, you're going to be safe from the flooding. Now, the discovery of these uh, mound builders will spark a great deal of debate in early America. Now, at first, in the 1800s, uh, at a time in which the Mormon religion is beginning to develop, they will at first claim that these may well be one of the so-called lost tribes of Israel. Lost tribes of Israel, there's supposedly in the past 12 tribes. Uh, there are a variety of different types of things that will happen to them, one of the most important of which is that some of them will be taken uh, in what's known as Babylonian captivity, uh, away to uh, Mesopotamia, and there they'll serve as slaves for a few generations, be released, and then some of them will return back home. Others of them will kind of disappear. Not sure exactly what will have happened to them. Now, according to the Mormon ideology, philosophy, religion, they, one of those tribes of Israel will make their way to the Americas. And that's certainly a possibility. We just haven't found any supportive evidence yet of that actually having happened. But it doesn't mean that it didn't or that we won't find evidence of support of it in the future. In either case, later they'll find out from archaeology that this is unlikely to have been one of those lost tribes of Israel as they will have moved into this area before, several hundred years before, the tribes of Israel will have been dispersed. That happens about 600 or so BC, so it doesn't fit the time period, and these are thus unlikely to have been one of the lost tribes of Israel. From archaeology, we also know that they will vanish around 1400 AD, about uh, 600 years ago. Now, it's 
from archaeology that we gain our greatest amount of knowledge from these about these people since when Americans began to move into the area about uh, in the 1800s, 400 years after they had disappeared. In that intervening period of time, that 400-year period, other Native Americans will also move into the area. And they had absolutely no knowledge of this previous Native American group that had existed in, the, in this area. They knew nothing about uh, these people. So, these burial mounds, they're often places for people to be buried in. They're also places for people to live in as well, as in the larger ones at least, and smaller ones. Some of them can be in a variety of different types of shapes. Now, if we look at this mound from a different angle, you can see that it is fairly tall. You can see, again, people giving you a idea of the size of this particular mound is very large. Smaller ones, as you've seen here, can be in a variety of different types of shapes. Now if we move a little up in our view and look down upon it, we begin to see a shape develop moving around and around. And again, if we look at a higher angle, we can begin to see the entirety of that shape from the tail coiling around and undulating back and forth to eventually arrive at the head of the snake. And there are a variety of different types of shapes that these mounds can be in, from snakes and birds, uh, various different types of insects, all kinds of different types of things. And as I said, because these were sites in which people were buried, they will bury not just the body, but they will also bury that individual or individuals with items that they will have likely used during their life, items that was believed to be needed for them in the afterlife, so you would find them wearing their clothes. You would find that they would have uh, often food and pottery and a variety of tools and jewelry. In fact, it's from the jewelry that we see that the civilization is uh, fairly highly technologically advanced and something else unusual. That comes from the shells used as decoration, strung together often, uh, creating a necklace or a bracelet, something of that nature. These shells, many of them, will have been found to have come from locations that are a good distance away. Some of them from the Gulf of Mexico what we think is that the Cahokia civilization, the Mississippi culture, will use the rivers like the Mississippi, like the Ohio, to traverse like a highway from one location to another, all the way from Ohio all the way down to Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico. And they will make contact with a variety of other Native American tribes. And we believe, the current theory is, that they will trade with these various other Native American tribes for things like shells, using something that they, and pretty much they alone, especially in North America, being one of the very few Native American tribes that will have uh, the skill in metallurgy to work in copper. But copper is a very soft metal. It takes a good deal of technology in order to create it. You have to be able to create a fire that is hot enough to be able to melt it. That's not a common campfire 
You need something a bit hotter than that. You also need something like pottery to facilitate the smelting, the development of creation of copper itself from the raw ore into copper. But copper itself is a very malleable material, very soft, too soft to be able to be used for tools. A copper axe is not as good as a, a good stone axe. So most of the tools that they will use are still stone tools. Stone tools work really well. And again, this is at another location where I would have shown a video, a short video, on how people make stone tools, how they are used to uh, cut down trees, to skin animals, to butcher animals, to uh, cut things. But again, I don't have the ability to be able to do that with this type of format. So I'll let you look up those videos on your own, or maybe if I can, I'll find a link and I can put it in on Canvas. Uh, I'll try to do that. In any case, copper therefore is too soft of a metal to be able to be used for tools. Instead, it's used mainly for decorative purposes, jewelry. Copper is shiny. Everybody likes shiny things. And in nature, there really aren't that many shiny things out there. So it would have been a very valuable commodity for trade. It would have been highly desirable. But again, we aren't sure that this was used as trade because we haven't actually been able to find uh, copper made from the Cahokia civilization in these other areas outside of the Cahokia culture, at least not yet. Certainly, with more time, more archaeological studies, we may well be able to do so. But it just makes logical sense that this would have been used as a uh, means of trade. Other interesting finds from these burial sites are that the dead, before they were buried, had red paint on them. Now, it could have been that this paint was used as a way to try to preserve the body for as long as possible. Or it could have been that it is used as a kind of protection in the afterlife to keep evil spirits away from them. Or it could be that they were painted like this in life. Certainly we have examples of this in other civilizations around the world, such as the, uh, the Britons. We know that certain individuals in, the, in their society will paint themselves, such as the warriors during battle or just before battle, uh, painting themselves blue. So it may be that this red paint is what certain individuals in the Cahokia civilization will have during their life to, as an indicator of their place in the society, a leader, either a military leader or a religious leader. We don't really know, though. Just like we don't know that this may not just be an outward paint covering. It could be that they were heavily tattooed. If they were heavily tattooed, tattoos are done for a variety of different reasons in many different cultures around the world. 
Sometimes tattoos are used as a way to demark childhood from adulthood. So children would not be able to withstand the pain of tattooing, and tattooing can be very painful. Even today, tattooing can be a bit painful. In the past, it would have been much more painful, of course. Driving ink under the skin, you basically have to push it in there. And that can be painful. So, it could be that everyone in the mound builder civilization was tattooed who was an adult. It could be that in some cultures, tattoos are used to imbue individuals with supernatural power, supernatural ability. Sometimes it's used as a protection against a variety of different types of things, illness, uh, spirits, uh, all kinds of different types of things. So we don't really know why these bodies would have been painted, but we know they were painted. Interestingly, some have claimed that the Mound Builder people are an anomaly in human history, in that because there have not been found yet what would be construed as warlike weapons, weapons designed exclusively for warfare. That that means that these were a peaceful people. They did not battle amongst themselves. And in my opinion, that's kind of ridiculous. Every human civilization, every human battles, they war. This idea of a human utopia, where everyone is peaceful and loving and working together for the common good, is a myth. It doesn't exist. Human beings are human beings. Nobody's better than anyone else. We all covet and desire what other people have. Sometimes, if you're starving going to go out there and get what you need by whatever means necessary. But what are buried in with these uh, Native Americans are farm tools. Farm tools can be very effective weapons. We know this from a variety of different cultures. Chinese, for example, Peasants. It used to be that peasants in uh, the Chinese area, if a peasant were carrying a weapon, they could be immediately killed. If they're carrying farm tools, eh, not a problem. You're a peasant, you're a farmer. Go out and use your farm tool. But farm tools can be quite efficient tools of warfare as well. A number of of these farm tools have been modified and today are used in martial arts today. Nunchucks, for example, derive from a farming tool, the thresher. If you don't know what a thresher is, it's at this point that I would show you a video on what a threshing tool is. It's basically a wooden stick tied to another wooden stick, usually with uh, metal rings so that they're kind of joined together but fairly loosely enabling you to swing one of the sticks and then the other stick will go much faster and it will hit wheat generally and that will dislodge some of the seeds from the stalks and eventually you beat it and beat it and beat it, and eventually the seeds all fall off. Then you've got to go through a process of winnowing to remove the uh, small remnants of the, stock, uh, the stalk of the wheat that you've been beating. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and again, I would be showing you a video on how to winnow as well. You throw the seeds and the dried uh, wheat shaft up into the air, and the lighter wheat shaft would be blown away by the winds, and you're left with the heavier seeds. But in either case, again, you can look that up on your own as well. There are lots of videos on that in YouTube, or I may find a link for it that I can put up on Canvas. I don't know. In other case, form tools can make very effective weapons. And there are a number of civilizations, in fact, that use farm tools not just for weapons, but as a weapon of choice. Because once you have killed someone with this farming tool, you can then use it to harvest your food. And then that power that you have stolen from that person that you've killed from using that tool can then be imparted into the food that you've gathered. And then when you consume that food, you consume that power from that individual. So farm tools can be quite efficient killing weapons as well. So I don't think you can claim that they're peaceful people simply because they don't have uh, buried with them exclusive weapons of war. It could be that they didn't need them in the afterlife because, hey, they've already killed all of their enemies. Their enemies are too afraid of them in the afterlife. They will not come for them. This is a sign of bravery. We don't know. All right, so moving on. Another group of Native Americans, the Plains Indians. It's an image that people typically have of Plains Indians living in teepees. And again, I would at this point show a video on how a teepee is put together, how it's taken down, how it is transported, all of this type of stuff. But again, I uh, can't really do that with this type of venue. So this is a lifestyle, however, of Native Americans in the Plains area. The Plains area is between the Mississippi River and that of the Rocky Mountains. And there are lots and lots of different Native Americans living in this area. Flat, gentle, rolling hill area, lots of grassland, that type of thing. This is an image that we have of them, but it is an image that is created after the 1500s mid-1500s. Prior to that period of time, Native Americans in this area were actually semi-sedentary. They had agriculture, which means that during the growing season, they would remain in one location, planting their seeds, watering them, weeding them, harvesting them, and then after having harvested them, they would then pack up and move to another area, an area where, generally in winter, the uh, location had greater access to game or roots and berries, nuts, or something else. And then, once the winter was over, they'd go back to their uh, planting grounds. After about 15, the mid-1500s, their lifestyle will change to purely nomadic. And by the way, their agriculture consisted of corn, but other agricultural products as well, legumes, beans. Beans and corn make an excellent meal because they complement one another. You have your starch, your starch, your protein. It's a good, complete meal in and of itself. You don't really need a whole lot else other than that. But after the mid-1500s, their lifestyle will change dramatically when Europeans entering into this area in search of tales of gold will find that gold isn't all over the place. It isn't plentiful. So they'll pack up, leave, 
go back home. And the horses that the Europeans will have brought with them will be released into the wild to what the Europeans believe to die. But instead, this is an environment that is eminently suited for horses. Flat grasslands flowing for miles and miles and miles. So instead of dying, the horses will instead increase dramatically in number. And the Native Americans, who have seen Europeans riding the horses, will now ride them also. Now, interestingly, thousands of years earlier, horses actually existed in this area of the world. But for reasons that we're not sure of, there are a number of theories to explain, but they will die out. Some of the theories claim that the horses will die out because of human intervention, that they will be hunted to extinction. Others, that a disease will sweep through the area and wipe them out. Likely, it's probably a combination of the two. A disease will sweep through the area, cutting down their numbers rather dramatically, and then humans who will view them as just, you know, a food source at that time. They weren't viewed as pack animals or as um, an animal that you could ride, but just as a food source, will hunt the last remaining ones into extinction. But in either case, we don't really know what will happen. All we know is the horses will die out. But with the reintroduction of horses, the Native Americans in this area will now be able to use them to ride on. And now they can be able to hunt buffalo. Now, they had been hunting buffalo before, but generally very seldom. The type of bow that they had, the short bow, was usually insufficient to be able to penetrate very deeply into the hide of the buffalo. And so a single arrow, which might penetrate in a little bit, is only going to scare the buffalo off. So an adult buffalo will run off, and generally it's going to be so minorly impacted by this particular type of arrow because of the thick hide, because of the thick hair on the outside, that it's going to survive. So generally only the weak, the sick, the injured, the young, or the type of buffalo that they would have been able to capture. And that isn't going to uh, be very many. But with the introduction of the horse, or being able to ride on the back of the horse, you can now keep up with a buffalo that is running. So you can shoot arrow after arrow after arrow into the buffalo until... It has lost so much blood that it falls down, exhausted. You then get off of your horse, and you do the coup de gras upon the buffalo, killing it, and then you can butcher it and bring back massive amounts of meat. And steak, as we all know, well, most of us, is far superior in taste to unflavored corn mush. And by unflavored, I mean just corn mush. No sugar, uh, maybe salt, certainly no pepper or other types of spices that would have been, uh, that are commonly used in foods today. So you get kind of tired of eating your corn mush your beans, your squash, and steak is so much tastier, so much nicer for those who eat steak. So why bother to spend all that work, all that effort, 
in agriculture. You, know, you can just jump on a horse, ride out into the plains, the wind blowing your hair back. You're able to bring down as much buffalo as you want, as bring back as much meat as you want, and so you can live on just that. Live on just buffalo meat if you want. Supplemented, of course, by other types of things that you would gather. Maybe roots, berries, nuts, things of that nature. And, of course, the hide of the buffalo can be used to make clothing, shoes, and dwelling places, and the bones can be used to make musical instruments, the hides can be used to make musical instruments, all kinds of different types of things can be done. And so their civilization is transformed from being semi-nomadic, uh, I'm sorry, from being semi-sedentary to being wholly nomadic. Traveling with the migration of the buffalo from one location to another. And so we arrive at the image that we have of Native Americans today, which is much different than they had been before the mid-1500s. All right, from there we move to the east coast of the Americas, from Maine and Nova Scotia down through New England, all the way down south through Virginia which includes a large variety of Native American Indian tribes, including the Powhatan, the Sook, the Kikapu, the Blackfoot, and many others as well. These are overall generally referred to as the Algonquin. Now, Algonquin is not a tribal name. It's a trade language. It's the language that was being developed by Native Americans in this area so that they could trade with one another which is one of the first steps that you will have in basically becoming unified. And it is certainly conceivable that if Europeans had arrived a few hundred years later, that Native Americans in this area would have been more unified, if not a unified nation. And they would have likely have put up a greater fight uh, than the individual tribes did. Although, again, we have to realize that disease sweeping from other areas uh, in Mexico, for example, up into North America by trade routes will have wiped out a great many of these Native Americans by the time that Europeans will begin to arrive in this area as well. So vast areas will be opened for Europeans to begin to move into that would not otherwise, without that disease, have been available for the Europeans. Now the Algonquin are semi-sedentary. They have agriculture as well. They grow corn, squash, squash including things like pumpkins. Pumpkins are good eating. Many of you, I'm sure, at Halloween time when you buy your pumpkin, you will take the seeds, clean them off, uh, put a little salt on them, put them in the oven, and dry them out, and you've got nice edible pumpkin seeds. But you can also eat much of the pumpkin itself as well. And again, it's at this point that I would have shown a video on how you can make a pumpkin pie or pumpkin filling from a pumpkin. Basically, just cut it up, put it in the oven, cook it up, and just scrape it out, mash it up, and you've got filling that you can use to make either a pie or you can use it with flour and make uh, pumpkin bread and all kinds of different types of things. Pumpkin is edible, not just for Halloween decoration. Anyway, along the coastal area, they would have grown their 
uh, crops. And then during the winter, they would have moved inland where game is richer, more plentiful, where there would have been uh, the availability of other types of plant material that they would have gathered, roots, berries, nuts, things of that nature. And then during the growing season, back to the coastal area where they would have, again, grown the crops. They live in what were referred to as long houses. Here you can see one type of one in which the frame structure is created using branches of trees and then that can either be covered over by or you can put uh, the tree bark in the framework itself and that keeps rain out and generally in this area of the world uh, these places would have been quite comfortable except in the winter time of course but inside you could have a very large area you'd have a fire pit in here as well and the roof would have had openings to allow the smoke to exit so you don't get smoked out of there and here you would have lived with your extended family mom dad uh, brother sister aunts uncles cousins grandma grandpa that type of thing here is another image it's kind of a pill shape And uh, certain things that the Native Americans in this area will have, Europeans, when they move into the area, will incorporate in. For example, uh, the moccasins that the Native Americans will wear, a kind of shoe, Europeans will find far more comfortable than the shoes that they're used to wearing, and many will take to wearing those. And snowshoes, while Europeans will have uh, skis, snowshoes uh, will be brought in by these uh, Native Americans. Uh, bark, canoes, things of that nature will also be used. All right, so here is a variety of different Native Americans in North America giving you an example of the varieties of Americans in the area prior to the arrival of Europeans. <laughs>